Good morning, folks. This is lecture two of week two, and we're going to be uh, starting beam elements today. Okay. So on the agenda, it's uh, the content in chapter seven, which is uh, that bent rod problem that we did uh, last week with beam elements. And then I will talk about how to find the cross section of the uh, a, be, a beam uh, a beam model a beam element and then uh, also to discuss uh, what if you need to impose a point in your in your in your mesh okay in order to do that of course you have to be in the advanced meshing tool and we have never been there so we will, this is going to be our first encounter and also how to uh, have problems where different different uh, cross section beam beam cross sections are present now i want to remind you that when you took your deformable bodies course or stress analysis course when the subject of beams were discussed you drew a line but that line you indicated that although it represents the beam element or beam uh, problem what the cross section looks like, how the cross section looks like. Now, for example, when you draw a line, the cross section, if it's a circle, it really doesn't matter. In a, for example, in a, in a uh, cantilever problem like that. But when the cross section is not a circle, how it is oriented in space with respect to this coordinate system will tell you that it the, how the, the how the response uh, varies okay for example in a situation like that you said that the value of i uh, about the neutral axis is 1 over 12 bhq here you said it's pi diameter to the 4 over uh, 64 okay uh, now uh, the orientation is important if you actually have a non-circular cross-section. Uh, we'll get to that later. The other issue that I want to tell you is that when you do beam problems, uh, you uh, can do it in some cases in the uh, sketcher. And if that is the case, you will have to use the join operation in the, uh, in, in the program in order to be able to mesh it with beam elements, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, you may also be able to do it as a wireframe in space. These are different concepts because when you scatter, it's assuming that everything of that three-dimensional curve in space actually can sit in a plane. But if that is not the case, for example, take the case of a helix, there is no way you can do a helix in a sketcher. Okay, because that is not a two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional configuration. Let's move on. We're gonna, of course, we're gonna do this problem first. So I will show you how to do this problem first. This is the one that we did with uh, solid elements, and I told you that there are other ways of doing it, including beam element. And in fact, all problems in uh, on on the test, you're gonna say use all planes of symmetry that are applicable and use the most appropriate element. So that particular problem, if I was not interested in stresses, then you should realize that it had to be done with beam elements, okay? Now, beam elements are actually, uh, think about it as lines, okay? Uh, and nodes are at the end of that line. This is a linear beam element. Of course, it has two nodes, okay? And each node has six degrees of freedom, six unknowns. In other words, three translations and three rotations. That's why uh, when you uh, remember, rota rotation was important even when you took the stress analysis course, because remember, rotation showed up naturally in the, the, the derivations that you did. Okay. Now, uh, I will talk about planes of symmetry later on. We're going to come back and talk about it later on. So this table is going to be very important and uh, we'll worry about it later on okay so our first attempt is do this problem 
okay so because this is a planar sketch okay this this although it's a wireframe in space but it fits in a plane i'm gonna do it with the sketcher first okay so let's go ahead here start our uh, first problem which is the bent rod immediately i save it so file save management save as desktop where's my desktop desktop new folder and uh, i'll put down uh, bent rod bent rod with beams okay and then we say okay and we're going to make it now remember this is a, because it is a, a, a two-dimensional drawing i can do it in uh, in in the part design there's no problem so on that vertical plane i will sketch that inverted l like that the bent rod put dimensions on it so let me see this from here from here to here it is eight okay. uh, from he from here to here it is five and the radius of this uh, uh, fillet or curved area is one okay good exit now this is it this is our geometry so why don't we apply material to it so let's make it out of steel uh, now my material is right here uh, metal steel on that part okay now in order to be able to mesh this thing later on there is one operation that you have to do that you cannot find it in part design you have two choices you can go to generative shape design in other words here start shape generative shape design that's one way of doing it or you can do to mechanical design third from the bottom wireframe and surface design this wireframe and surface design is the cheaper version of the generative shape design you can do a lot of stuff in the generative shape design that cannot be done here for our purpose it doesn't matter however i will go to generative shape design right the only operation that you need here is this guy join if you don't join this you will not be able to mesh it with uh, beam element okay so i'm going to join it i mean that statement is true if you're using a sketch of course click on it and all you have to do is to select the sketch nothing happens here it says sketch one join that's it nothing else is needed good so let's save everything now we're going to go to generative uh, uh, analysis and simulation generative structure analysis we have been doing this thing for the past two weeks okay it is a static analysis that we're doing great however you notice that nothing happens in other words in the past we had a solid object as soon as katia saw the solid object it actually meshed it but nothing happens here because it doesn't see a solid object so we have to do that ourselves notice that this model manager toolbar let me close this the model manager toolbar which has got the traffic light here if you go to the first icon and expand it you see that this thing pops up and it's the beam measure that we want beam measure you click on this and you select that if you had not joined this in the generative shape design 
you will, you will not be able to pick this. So, but we joined it, so no problem. We selected this turn, it's yellow. And this is the size of the element, linear and parabolic. Although I can caution you, this parabolic one, it may not be activated in, uh, in, our, in, you know, in, in the license that we have. So I always use linear one because this one I've had experience that it said not supported, et cetera. So linear one. And the size is going to be basically how big these elements are along that line. Beam elements are very robust. In other words, you can use very few beam elements and get good results. Okay. And so uh, I'll put down point 0.2 here. Point 0.2, that means that, okay, this whole thing was, I don't know, maybe this was around 5. So we're talking about 20 elements or something like that. 30 element along this edge. That's okay. I'll just leave it point 0.1. Good. Now, if you want to see the mesh, the usual thing, notice that the mesh has been here created, but if you want to see it, right click on the nodes and element mesh visualization and just wait here. Nothing fancy. If you put the cursor close enough, zoom in, you see that element nine goes between nodes 12 and 13. Element eight goes between 11 and whatever, uh, 12. Etc. So you can see that the middle thing is the element number and the ones around it are the node numbers. Great. Nothing fancy like what we saw in the uh, solid elements, the trader elements. The rest of it, you just deactivate this. Same as before. Now, we have to tell the software how the cross section looks like. Okay? How the cross section looks like. I'm going to do this problem for you. Because the cross section is circular, but I will come back and show you what is the uh, what is the problem if the cross section is not circular. Okay, we'll come to that later on. Right now, it's a circle. We don't have to worry about it. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, so here's the one D element. This is something that we never used because Katia did it for us automatically. Three D elements. This is something that we're gonna do later on when we talk about shell type elements. We haven't done that yet. 1D element, it looks like looks like an I-beam. You can see that. Looks like an I-beam, it says 1D property. You click on it and it says, okay, what is the thing that you wanna get, give cross section of? So right here. Now notice that the selection here is cylindrical beam. That means solid cross section. And there is a wrench here. You click on the wrench, it says here is the radius of the cross section. Now, if my radius of the cross section is one, I can change that to one and I say okay. And notice that I can close it. If this thing was non circular, it was not a circle, this okay would be dim. It won't even let me do that until I go and select a proper point which actually orients this thing in the direction that I want. What I'm talking about is this. Okay, that point that we have to pick will tell you how this is oriented. But right now, it's a circle. We don't have to worry about it. And we just say, okay. Notice the material was selected properly. And we say, okay. Good. Now, we know that this bottom one is clamped. And we know that there is a force applied here, which is 2,000 pounds. Do you remember this problem? 2,000 pounds. 2,000 pounds. There are no planes of symmetry here. We already talked about it. Even when we looked at this solid element, there were no planes of symmetry when this thing was loaded in the direction X. So uh, we apply the load, here's the force, at that point, in the direction x, 2,000, or minus 2,000, depending on what you want. And you see, whoa, the direction is wrong. Let me go fix it. Uh, load is here, double click on it. I put it in direction y, incidentally. That should have been x, minus 2,000 in x. Okay, right there, you can see that, yeah? 
Let's save our analysis file. File, save management, analysis, save as. Uh, in that same folder, pen drive with beams. Analysis goes there, OK, and just run it. There's nothing else to do. And it's done. So let's look at the deformation. There is a deformation. Let's animate it. Does it look right? Of course. This bends, and this piece, vertical one, bends and torques, of course. You can see that. Would you like to see the numbers? You click on the displacement. These are the number in inches. And if you want to see it in color, double click on these arrows or go to the tree and double click on translation here, average ISO, etc. Right there, you can see that. The biggest, of course, displacement is going to be here, the smallest one down there. Notice that one Mises stress is dim. You cannot plot it. There is something here that you can plot and it says principal stress. That's it, principal stress. But when you plot it, if you zoom in, you see that all it is is the axial principal stress, which obviously for this is zero, like almost zero. You can see that. This is a bending and torsion problem. Axial stress is going to be very minute in it. Okay, you can see that. Even if I change this thing to color, you can. It's just not going to give you anything useful. That's pretty much it. I mean, this is it. See, look at all these numbers. It's all pretty much zero. So the moral of the story is that this problem can be solved with beam elements very effic efficiently, good displacements and everything, but unfortunately we cannot get the stresses. So let me show you what if the cross section was not actually uh, circular, okay? So let me, uh, de uh, let me uh, deactivate this, by the way. Good, good, let's go back here. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to my parts. There's my parts. Double click on it. Okay. You remember this? This is where we were. Now, I'm going to create two points off that curve. And the reason I do two, uh, actually, let me do three points. Point number one, not that zero, zero. I'll make it one inch in the direction X. There, right there. I'll do another one. One and one. So it's going to be here. And a third one, zero and one. You see why. Good. That's pretty much it. Go back to the analysis. There we are. Go to the properties, 1D properties. You remember this is where we, we identified, uh, this is where we said uh, uh, what the cross section looks like. Double click on it. I don't want cylindrical. I want rectangular just to make it really uh, show itself. I make it rectangular. And what is the size of that rectangle? I'm going to exaggerate it, make it one and two so that you can see it. One and two. Okay, look. Actually, to make it even worse, I'm going to make it one and, or maybe point, uh, I don't know, point five, maybe. Okay, point five. Yeah, right there. You can see that. Notice that I can't even close this. The okay is dim. Until I go and select an orientation point here. See that? Orientation geometry. So let me select this one for you. And I want you to watch the, watch the rectangle, what happens to it. You see, it rotates and it puts it in a certain direction. What if I selected a different point? This point. You see, it's a different orientation. What if I selected this other guy? You see, these orientations are all different. The moral story is that when you have a non-circular cross-section, to define the 1D property, namely the cross-sectional shape and the size, you can't even col close this without actually selecting an orientation point. When it's a circle, it doesn't matter. Now, there's something else that I want to show you. Let me cancel that, put it back to that circle. 
put it back to that circle. Suppose you said that, you know what? Actually, the rod here has a different cross section. It has, it, it has, a, has a different cross section. Let's say circle with a different radius, okay? So what I can do, instead of radius being one, suppose I want a radius to be uh, 0.3 or something like that. So what you do, you put the cursor on the property, 1D property, right there. Right click, local 1D property. You go down to local 1D property. And it says, okay, where is it that you want to change that? Well, it's on this vertical vertical thing that I want to change. And you click on the wrench, it says, what is the radius there? So suppose I made the radius point, I don't know, point. 0.25, yeah, 0.25, we say okay, and we say okay. So what happens is this. Initially, we put a radius one of all these cross sections. Then we went and said, yeah, but on this one, I don't want one. There's no way you can get rid of this. It's going to stay there. But notice that it it changed the uh, through that the process that we did, local 1D property, what happens is that maybe we made this thing 0.3, and of course that means, and of course up here it shows you also 0.3 right there. So for that vertical beam, the cross-section is not what I initially gave, but the radius is 0.3. So that is how one way of changing the cross-sectional shape. Now, as a matter of fact, if you want, you can actually go here. Let me go back to uh, let me back to local 1D property. If I insist, for example, I can say, you know what? Uh, I don't want it to be rectangular. I want it. To, uh, sorry, I don't want it to be circular. I want it to tu uh, tubular. These are the sizes that we're going to give. So, for example, 0.5, and I think we did two last time. It won't let you close it unless you select the orientation point. For example, I can go and select this. Uh, not tubular, what I meant was uh, rectangular, right, rectangular. Uh, let's give it the right value. So uh, a 0 0.3 and, uh, I don't know, 0 0.3 and uh, two, so you can see it. Ah, look. I selected this orientation point, it gives me on this vertical one, on this vertical one, we have a rectangular cross section with the size that I gave you. So it is possible to do this, to change the cross section along the different parts of the beam. It's possible. Now in this particular problem, ours was very simple, it's like that. So now I wanna go a different problem because the problem that I did actually had no planes of symmetry. Okay, so now we're going to go to this problem. Let me go ahead and I'm going to do this thing two ways. One of them, create this thing as a sketch with and without plane of symmetry. Do it as a sketch and I will also do it as a wireframe. Okay, so let's go ahead here. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to kill this. And that. So we go back to our problem. This is what we got. The minute it says model this thing with beam elements. Okay. The radius of this radius is 10, and the cross section as a circle, also of radius, uh, well, of radius one. Okay. Now. This top point, this top point is uh, pinned. You can see that. And I'm applying a force of 100 pound to this, the bottom of this ring. The most appropriate element would be beam element because we're told to use beam elements right there. You don't have to think a lot here. Do we have any planes of symmetry? The answer is yes. All I need to do is to take half of this. In other words, cut it to the exit plane. Cut it to the exit plane. Okay. 
Now you might say, yeah, how about why is that plane? Why is that plane is also a plane of symmetry if this was solid object? If it's a beam, you don't cut the beam lengthwise into two pieces. So planes of symmetry when it comes to beams are the ones that are perpendicular to the geometry of the beam. Okay, so this beam, the plane of symmetry is XZ. Do not cut it in the ZY plane. You cannot because you just draw a line. How are you going to draw a line uh, and cut it into two pieces? A line, you draw a line on paper and say, oh, divide this thing into two pieces lengthwise. Well, we can't do that. Okay, so first approach is going to be uh, with the plane of... Uh, uh, with a plane of symmetry, okay? So let me go ahead and uh, start a part file. Where am I? Start a part file. Okay. Remember, at some point, we have to join stuff. If that is the case, would you like to stay here? We can do that. And I have two choices. One is to draw that thing as a sketch, okay? And I'm gonna do it like that. And then come back and show you what if we did not want to draw that thing as a sketch? What if we drew, wanted to draw it in 3D? So uh, we'll, we'll do that later. And if we don't, if we run out of time, we'll do it uh, on Friday's, uh, Friday Labs presentation that's gonna be posted. Anyway, on that vertical plane, I will sketch. Half a circle. So, yeah. Half a circle. Okay. Let's give it a dimension. The dimension for this is uh, 10 inches, right? 10 inches. All right. Now, what you see here, 10 inches is this length okay now uh that's pretty much it exit okay exit apply material to it steal on that part say okay and don't forget to join because if you don't join you will not be able to mesh this join And okay, we could have done this thing in part design, but for joining operation, we would have to come to generative shape design. That's pretty much it. So we go to, oh, let's save it, file, save management, save as, desktop, new folder, I'll call it uh, ring, with beam elements. Please make sure you do these things because you have uh, on, the, on the test, you have several problems. Do not put everything in the same folder. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Now we're going to go to generative structure analysis, just like before. We are doing a static analysis. We have to do the meshing ourselves right there. You see that? All that. Okay. And uh, the size, we keep it as it is, no problem. And uh, we, we, we can see the mesh if you want. We can see the mesh. Right click mesh visualization. And you can zoom in if you want. These are the element numbers and node numbers surrounding it. We're using linear beam element. And deactivate this because there's nothing you can do after you, once the mesh is looking at you. This top point, this top point is you might say, oh, this shows me a pin. You're absolutely right. 
However, is there anything that allows this thing to rotate about the z-axis? The answer is no. There's nothing that allows it to rotate about the z-axis. So first of all, the three translations are fixed. Let me actually uh, say it a different way for you. Let me, let, me, let me say this thing a different way. Uh, notice that uh, this top point, this point does not translate in any direction, does not rotate about Z, does not rotate about Y. There's no way that this thing can swing about Y. And there's no thing, there's no way that this can, uh, you know, rotate about the, uh, the X axis. The moral story is, although it shows you pin, but for all practical purposes, that point is a clamp. So I can go there and either clamp this or say all of these are fixed. That's the same effect as having it clamp right there. Good. Now, this point, this bottom point, is in the plane of symmetry XZ. And this table tells you what to do. If it is the plane of symmetry is XZ, it cannot move in Y, correct? It cannot move in Y. Okay, I'll come to that in a minute. So we go here. User define. Let me uncheck all of these. This point cannot move in Y. As soon as you identify that, that's very easy. Rotations are important here. It's going to be exactly the opposite of these translations. So, in other words, if something was not checked, you're going to check them for rotation. If something was already checked, leave it alone. And that's what this table is saying. So if XZ is a plane of symmetry, UY is zero by checking that, and rotations opposite UX and UZ, or theta X and theta Z are zero. This is exactly what I said. UY is zero, and rotations opposite, and the other ones are free. So that is how we do symmetry in beams. We say, okay, now we're gonna apply a force down here, force at that point in the direction Z, in the direction Z, and I hope you realize that it's gonna be half of 100 pounds, 50 pounds. So, in the direction Z, negative 50. And we say, okay. Save the analysis. Save the analysis in that folder, which was called ring with beam element. And then run it. Oh, you know what? I forgot to say what the cross section looks like. <laughs> okay, 1D element right there, 1D element. Select this. It's a cylindrical beam. Radius is 1. I'm pretty sure we said that the diameter is 2, radius is 1. Okay, and we don't need orientation point because the cross section is circular. Now save it and run. Done. Would you like to see how it deflects? Let me put it in the front view because this is a two-dimensional problem. You can see that right there. And uh, two-dimensional problem. So, uh, uh, yeah, here's the deflection. Let me exaggerate the scale. So amplification factor, let me make it uh, uh, 3,000. Well, no, not 3,000, 3,000, not 300, 3,000. So that you can see a bit more deflection. There. Are you happier now? 
would you like to see the numbers? You click on that, and you click on these arrows, make it average ISO. There we are, and you can animate it. I mean, obviously, you have to change the scale here, too, if you want to see it better. And you can animate it. Notice that this point does not go to the left, does not go to the right, does not turn around the Z, and this is what you're going to get. Now, I'm going to repeat this problem, except that I will not use a plane uh, of symmetry. Okay? So let me actually start fresh. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to close this. Yeah, I don't know what now. Actually, we can we can go here. We can go here. Now, uh, let's go to our sketch. Oh, not sure. Let me go to uh, our sketch here. And I can actually uh, close this. What I mean by close that is that I'm pretty sure I can take this thing and and turn it into a. <laughs> okay, you can. Ah, let let me let me cancel this for a second. As a matter of fact, control Z, control Z. Okay, good, good. Uh, you know what? Be the reason I was I was actually being. I was able to move things around here. Let me let me fix this point, okay? Because right now I can move it up and down, okay? I can fix this point. There the are different ways of doing it. For example, you can uh, you can say uh, here uh, dimension. Where is that dimension? Dimension from here to here. Actually, escape. Just a second. Let me do this. This point control. The origin or this point control the origin right there we can make it coincident right there okay good now I can close it quite easily right there you can see that and the different ways of you can make this coincident with that or there are other ways I showed you in class this point let, let me show you a different way this dimension between this point and this point right click coincident Oh, close. Okay, good, good. Exit. So this is what we got. You have to join. Don't forget to join. We already joined it because I'm using the good old graph that I had earlier. And you have to put material properties. And I need one more thing. I need a point. A point here and a point up there. Two points. I need two points. You'll see why I need those two points. So I'm going to make one point. On the top, which is going to be z equal to 10. And another point at the bottom, which is minus 10. Good. You'll see why I need these two points. Now we're going to go to uh, uh, generative structure analysis. Static analysis. Use the beam element to mesh this. And this is fine. You can actually see your mesh, right? Click mesh visualization, and you can see that, no problem. The problem is that these two points that we created, let me see now, they're hiding right here. Hide, show, and hide, show. The problem is, oops, where are they? Let me hide this. Okay. I can't get this point. Just one second. Let me see now. Uh, part body, height show. No, right there. And height show. Oh. <laughs> the problem is that there is no guarantee that these two points are actually a node. And I need it because I want to apply the strain this and I want to I want to move this thing down. There's no guarantee. In fact, in fact, they may not be in all likelihood. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete this mesh. I'm going to delete this element. And I have to do this meshing somewhere else, not here. So we're going to go to the advanced meshing tool. Let me get my curve here. Right there. Right there. Advanced meshing tool. Notice that 
this kind of different. We have never been there. This is the first time you're going there. And we're going to mesh. We, we see this beam mesher here, just like before. We see it here. You click on it. Notice that there's more stuff down below. The top portion of it was just like before. So we select this. But then we have the opportunity to adding extra points to the mesh. So you click on that. You select this. Say OK. And do it again. You select this. And say OK. I guarantee you that the mesh that we get, the mesh that we get has nodes at these two points. The rest of the problem is just before, just like before. You go to generative structure analysis. Define the cross section right there. Don't forget. I mean, the mesh, you can look at the mesh if you want right here. Mesh visualization. OK, and I guarantee you those two points are actually part of my problem. Deactivate the mesh. Now, uh, 1D property, let me co collapse this. We don't need that. Uh, 1D property, just like before, you select that. And one or inch radius, no problem. Okay. Now, we're going to clamp that top point. Right there, you can see that. And that is going to be a node. This is why it works. And then we apply a force down here, 100 pounds. A hundred pounds minus a hundred pounds. Now, if we had not included these points as a node by going and doing that fancy stuff in the advanced machine tool, when you put the load here, it doesn't see it. But now it will. Okay. And let's go ahead and run it. Great. Done. So look at the view from the front. And look at the deflection, deformation. Let me change the scale here so that you can see it better. Remember, I made this thing 3,000 so that you could see it better right there. Okay. And uh, you can animate it, in fact. You can see that this one is fixed. This one is pushed down by 100 newtons, 100 pounds, actually. Would you like to see a deflection right there? Okay, and I never paid attention, but these numbers, these deflections should be the same as what we got before. I didn't pay attention to it, but uh, they should be the same. If, if not, I've made something, I've, I've made a mistake somewhere, okay? And uh, yeah, so uh, let's, uh, uh, let me see now. There is uh, something else I wanted to show you, and that is, I still have five minutes, and I would like to show you that. So, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, let let me uh, let me uh, go to that uh, go to that I beam problem that I did not I beam, but the was that the bent rod that I did for you a minute ago? Actually, I can bring. I'll make it very easy because I'm, something that you should uh, understand here, just to convince you. So, let me sketch something here and make that uh, bent rod. Okay. I'm not going to put any dimensions there, so just leave it the way it is. And uh, the only thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to join. Let's exit this. I'll put material on it. I'll put material on it. Okay. Uh, whatever it was, steel on that part. You say okay. And there we are. Okay. Now, this I could have done it, of course, in the uh, part design. I did it here, but uh, notice that I'm not joining it. So let me go to the generative structure analysis. And I try to mesh it right here. It won't even let you take it. See this? 
He won't let you do that. Believe me, if you went to the advanced meshing tool, you see that you won't be able to mesh it there either. So let's convince you. Go there. Try to mesh it. No way. Now, why did that happen? Because we did not join it. So let's go back to our part. Remember how we did? Went back. Back to our part in the generative shape design, which I happen to be there. Join this and say okay, and now go back and try to mesh it. Uh, here's advanced meshing tool, or you can do generative structure analysis. E either one, it really doesn't matter. Click on this. Before it won't it won't let you do that without the joining. Now it does. So that joining is critical if you want to be able to mesh it with beam elements. That's the way CATIA works, of course. <laughs> All right, folks, so uh, the presentation in tomorrow's lab, uh, and I already told you that I'm not going to be here. The presentation is going to be video and posted for you the night before. Uh, the GA, the labs are going to be running. The GAs are going to be there to check your work. And uh, I've already mentioned this thing to you in class. And I will be sending also an email to all of you or an announcement in, uh, in Brightspace so that you know what the story is. Tomorrow's lab is on, but I'm not going to be here. The GAs are going to be checking your work. Okay. Thank you.